the sun. The sun is the primary life force of our solar system and of course here on Earth. Its life-giving power is observed in abundance nearly everywhere on our planet. Along with the life that it brings, it is also the primary force of our environment and our weather. So it also at times can wreak havoc on our lives with climate change, severe weather, destruction, death, and desolation. Its wonders are rarely ever taken into account. But, however bad at times, it still gives and sustains life from the smallest of creatures to the largest. And of course us. Another example of its power is what we term as the solar cycle. On average, every 11 years, the sun transforms from a milder minimum to a much more active and powerful maximum state. We are now in the midst of one of these solar maximum cycles. NASA has predicted this one will be very active and will peak sometime in 2013. It is this possibility and its potential consequences that we will discuss in the rest of this video. This is Solar Maximum Cycle 24. I get asked often about such terms as K4, K5, M-Class, X-Class, CME, and Solar Flares. What do these mean? And what do they really mean to me in my daily life? We will explain these terms in greater detail shortly. Most people live their daily lives without ever giving the sun a second thought, except for whether it will be sunny or cloudy on a given day. But in a world where we rely on electricity in almost every aspect of our lives, there are some potential hazards that you should at least be aware of and hopefully be prepared for. We hope that this video will provide you with the information you need to be aware and to prepare for these potential hazards. So with that in mind, let's discuss terminology. What is a CME or coronal mass ejection? Coronal mass ejections are huge bubbles of gas threaded with magnetic fields that are ejected from the sun over a course of several hours. Coronal mass ejections also disrupt the flow of the solar wind and produce disturbances that strike the earth, sometimes with catastrophic results. Coronal mass ejections are often associated with solar flares and prominence eruptions, but they can also occur in the absence of either of these processes. In the simplest of terms, a CME is a massive cloud of magnetically charged plasma weighing billions of tons and traveling a few million miles per hour. So, what is a solar flare? A solar flare is a huge explosion on the sun that happens when energy stored in twisted magnetic fields is suddenly released. This heated material rises to many millions of degrees and emits a huge burst of radiation across the electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves, x-ray, to gamma rays. These can be seen as bright flashes of light on many sensors from NASA's SOHO platform as in this example from SOHO www.nascom.nasa.gov. Solar flares are classified by the following categories. X-Class these are huge events that can trigger radio blackouts around the globe and cause powerful and long-lasting radiation storms in our upper atmosphere. These can also cause blackouts of our power grids, such as occurred before. M-Class 
These are medium sized and can cause brief radio blackouts in our planet's polar regions as well as minor to moderate radiation storms. C-Class. These are much smaller and have few noticeable effects on Earth. The K-Index. This is very much like the Fujita scale for tornadoes in that the higher the number, the stronger and potentially more damaging a geomagnetic storm can be to us and our normal lives. As a note, all addresses and links to sites referenced in this video will be listed and properly credited at the end of the video as well as listed in the video details so you can monitor events as well. You might be asking yourself at this point, what in the heck does all this really mean to me? Well for that, we must review some history. Let us review the Carrington event. One late morning on September 1st, 1859, a 33-year-old English astronomer named Richard Carrington was in his observatory carefully sketching the sunspots that were being projected from his telescope when right before his eyes two brilliant spots of light appeared over the sunspots. These spots grew very large and upon running to go get in return with a witness some 60 seconds later they both watched as the light shrunk down to pinpoints before finally disappearing. What we know now, he saw, was a massive solar flare and along with the following events that of course now bear his name. Less than 24 hours later, as the effects from the solar flare and the corresponding CME hit the Earth, auroras, normally confined to the upper and lower polar regions, covered most of the planet, reaching as far south as the tropics, in Cuba, the Bahamas, and Jamaica. Even more alarming, the world's telegraph systems went haywire. Sparks were discharging, shocking telegraph operators, and even caused some fires. So, what would happen in our modern society if such an event happened today? One thing scientists tend to agree on is that this is highly unlikely. Although very entertaining, this is just fantasy, creative fiction, and some awesome special effects. But, don't get too relaxed. The reality of such an event occurring today is actually scarier in many ways. Unlike the fictional scenes just shown, we will have to try and actually live through it. There already has been many harmful events since 1859 in recent years, so we know they do happen. Here are just a few. March 13, 1989, a geomagnetic storm disrupted power in Quebec, blacking out about 6 million people for 9 hours. And like the Carrington event, it also induced current into the lines, causing power surges that melted a huge transformer in New Jersey. There were about 200 other incidents reported on the North American power grid, including a nuclear plant in New Jersey. In May of 1998, a solar flare disabled Pan Am Sat's Galaxy 4 satellite and disrupted ATM machines, credit card machines, weather tracking services, and 80% of all the pagers in the United States. There have been a number of very strong X-Class flares in recent times. August of 1989, on April 2, 2001, an X-Class 28 overloaded the Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite, or GOES, that is used in part to observe the sun, rendering it useless for a time. And there were a number of X-Class flares in 2011 as well. We have just been lucky enough that none of these recent events have been strong enough and or pointed directly at Earth. It is very important to remember that sometime or other, our luck is going to run out. There are just shy of 1,000 operational satellites in orbit around the planet right now. Of all the things that we rely on daily, these are most susceptible to damage from a huge solar event. So when the next huge event occurs, and you think you're going to go out amongst the panic-stricken public and pull out some funds at the ATM, or stop by the store to pick up some supplies with your credit or debit card, it's not likely. That includes gas. These are satellite transactions. Cell phones? also satellite supported. Get some much needed news and information from your TV, also once again not likely, satellites. And if your electrical grid is down, you also won't be able to get your most precious commodity either. There are also concerns that a Carrington type of it might even fry the ECM in your car and render your vehicle useless. GPS navigation will be gone or useless, and I for one don't even want to think about airline travel during such a large solar storm. This list of potential hazards could go on and on, like heat during the cold, 
or air conditioning during the sultry summertime, but this video is not intended to go over every potential hazard or possibility. We just wanted you to be aware of some of the potential dangers we all face living with our sun. Scientists have warned of these potential dangers and they have been reported in the news, but many still are not aware. Are you talking about knocking out uh, the United States uh, for months before we can get enough rescue crews and repairmen to handle not just one city, but hundreds of cities around the United States? You know, Michio, sometimes you come on here and you sound like the doctor of doom and gloom. Does, this, well, th I, does something like this keep you up at night? Um, it does, and I think with Katrina, you know, engineers knew that Katrina could happen, but they did nothing because they said that it's not going to happen while I'm around. Well, now we learned the lesson. You have to prepare for things, especially when you know that at some point it's inevitable that we're going to have another big one, like we had back in 1859, except this time we're totally dependent on electricity. Okay, now you have an idea of what can happen in the next super solar event. You might ask, what should I do now? Well, you've already taken the first step by getting informed. We have included an excellent list of links for monitoring space weather and solar events in the detailed section, which you can access by pressing show more. This video is not intended to be a detailed survival video. There are lots of excellent sources like videos and other sites on the internet to help you plan. Every family's plan should be specific to your own personal needs. For me, I like to keep it simple following these basic rules. Number one, stay aware and be informed. Number two, water. I cannot emphasize this enough. You must have enough water for every member of your family. Keep it sanitized with chlorine or iodine and keep it dated and rotated. Store as much as possible. Number three, food. Not steak and potatoes, mind you, but the bare bone necessities. Canned items, snacks that include protein and carbohydrates. These are easy to eat and easy to store. Number four, make a family plan and implement it. It should include things like batteries, radios, flashlights, blankets, candles, medicines, basic first aid kits, and have a plan in case family members get separated, like a meeting place. Number five, stay away from the panic people whenever possible. Panic people tend to make dangerous decisions. If you have a plan, you will have the confidence to avoid these issues. And who knows, because of your good planning, you might have the confidence to safely guide and help others who are suffering from panic. Number six, core temperature. Research, look up, and learn how to keep your body's core temperature in the safe zone, both in cold and hot situations. And number seven, more water. As previously stated, there are plenty of excellent sources on survival planning on the internet. One of my favorites is When All Hell Breaks Loose by Cody Lundin. Stay safe and thank you for watching. Be sure to look for other upcoming videos from Tim TV and come visit Tim's World on Facebook and join the discussion.